History lies in the heart of the debate, and the debate rages regarding simple things like what the definition of certain words are. I made a video a few years ago defining the historical definitions of socialism and capitalism. Despite using multiple sources, from primary sources to history books to the Oxford English Dictionary, apparently my definitions are wrong, and I've received a lot of criticism over the past three years for supposedly misleading people and not admitting my mistakes. Well, I've held off from addressing this specific criticism for three years, simply because it's not been a priority. But today, I want to tackle the major counter-arguments I've received and confirm that the historical definitions of socialism and capitalism are what history says they are, not what postmodern political ideologues believe they are. I'm going to start off this video by clarifying what I did and didn't say. In response to a recent poll on my channel where the majority of my viewers have said I should talk about politics and economics, which goes against the very vocal minority saying I should stick to tanks, Horatio Pelagius said this. I recently unsubscribed to you, so I'm not sure why this poll has been shown to me, but your political and economic opinions are completely ludicrous, and you don't understand the very basics of the political theory you discuss. Your historical analysis, despite this, is pretty good, and the production quality of your videos is excellent. You do an excellent job presenting them as well. Stick to tanks so I can subscribe again and actually enjoy and learn from you. I bring this comment up specifically because it expresses an extremely common view often repeated by those who dislike what I've said with regards to socialism. He's not the only one to say this sort of thing, but is one of the more pleasant to read examples. When pressed, Horatio then responded, I do take issues with Tick's definitions of socialism because he defines almost literally everything as socialism. It's highly likely you believe in many things that are in fact socialism, according to Tick, and are also a socialist as far as he's concerned. Again, this is a very common criticism of my work. But is it true? Did I really say that everything is socialism? Or did I say something else? Well, in my public versus private video, I explain that the public sector is the state. I explained what the public sector was a societal hierarchy, or a hierarchy of society. I explained that there were numerous synonyms for this structure, from a group, to a nation, to a society, to a public, to a worker collective, etc. We can confirm this is the case in reality by simply thinking about a tribe. Each hut in the tribe is a private abode. But, collectively, we'd say that this is a tribal state. It doesn't matter what form of governance, if any, the tribe has, be it democratic, priestly, or a monarchy, the fact is that the tribe itself is a tribal state. It is a society. And when society controls a piece of territory, it becomes political. It forms a hierarchy of some kind, and that hierarchy becomes the state. The same applies elsewhere. A nation is a society, a commune is a society, a workers' trade union is a society, and all of these are hierarchies. So, I did say that society, the public, is the state, and that the state and society is a political hierarchy. But what I didn't say was that the mere existence of a state meant that it was socialism. People took what I said to mean that, but I made it clear, or at least I thought I did, that the definition of socialism was the public ownership or control of the means of production. We'll come back to this specific definition later, but sticking to the wider point for now, the public is the state, but that doesn't mean that everything is socialism. It's only socialism when the state or public has control of the means of production. So, if we have a state and then a free market, we can't say that the entire nation is socialist. The states might be socialist, their policies might be socialist, and they might be scheming to convert the economy into socialism, at which point we could say that the state is socialist. But if the market is free, if the private sector can operate without public sector interference, then the market itself is not socialist, and thus the whole country cannot be said to be socialist, even if the state is. Because this is a major bone of contention, I'm going to hammer this point home by explaining this in a different way. 
Let's take our example of the tribe again. For a lack of better terms, let's just say that the tribal nation as a whole is called the Purple Tribe. So, when I say the word purple here, I mean the entire tribal society or nation, government or not. So, we have purple, then we have the individual private huts, and the public tribal state government. Now, let's just say in this instance they have a king who happens to be a socialist. He's running the government and he wants to implement total control over the private sector, socialism. But he hasn't done it yet. We would say that the king is socialist, the government is socialist, but the private sector isn't socialist. Thus, purple cannot be described as a socialist nation, even if the government is socialist. There's two ways we're using the word society or public, and they're intermingled. Society as a whole is called the public, and the public sector is the state. But while the public might not be socialist, the public sector could be socialist. Now, you might argue that this is confusing, and therefore that proves that I'm wrong, but I'm just telling you what the definitions of the words are, and how they were used historically, and how they're used today. It's not my fault the ancient Greeks, the Romans, and we today have conflated the words public and society with the state. I'm just telling you that's what's happened. Don't shoot the messenger. If I say the word British... Am I referring to the British Isles? Am I referring to the United Kingdom of Great Britain? Am I referring to the government of the United Kingdom? Or am I referring to the British public? There's no way to know because we've mashed all those terms together. The only way to know is for me to make it clear. The British government, or the British Isles, or the British people who call themselves British, etc. But just saying British by itself could mean several different things. Well, the same thing applies to the word public. Do I mean the nation as a whole, the people within it, the government, or something else? Exactly. It's all mashed together under the same word. This is how you guys have been tricked. When they say that socialism is when society owns the means of production, you're assuming that to mean that the people or the workers will run the factories together democratically. But that's the trick. Your socialist leaders may even encourage you to think that, but in reality, the word society has two meanings. One is the people as a whole, and the other meaning is the state. You think it means the first one, but it doesn't. It means the second. Instead of the people running the factories, it'll be the state running the factories, because the state is society. The people are the public, and the public is the state. That's why you've been tricked. The two meanings are the same thing. The people are the state. Democracy is a state, a form of government. Socialism is state control of the means of production. Nothing else. I hope that makes sense, because I'm honestly at a loss as to how to make this any clearer. Like, I genuinely don't know how people are not understanding this, and then misinterpreting really basic things that I'm saying. If you see anyone in the comments struggling with this concept, Perhaps you might have a better go at it than explaining it than me, because I've exhausted all of my options at this point, and it's a really basic concept. <laughs> to summarise this point then, historically, humanity has defined society as the state. Now, I personally don't agree with that statement. I think that it's dangerous. It's a dangerous idea to pretend that the state somehow represents society, because it doesn't in any way, shape or form. Even in a direct democracy, the state is not society, and society is not the state. But that's my own personal view. And when presenting history, I've got to go with how the majority of humanity has defined things. And if the majority of humanity mistakenly believes that the state is society, and that's how they've defined it, then that's what I have to say it is. If you think I'm wrong here, then it's not me who's wrong. It's society, because society is the one thinking this, not me. The public sector is the state. That's what society says. Socialism is state ownership of the, or control of the means of production. That's what society says. I didn't make it up, nor do I necessarily agree, but that's what I've got to say, because history is a praxeology, a study of human action. If humans have acted and defined something as X, then I can't say it's Z. I have to say society thinks it's X, even if I know it's Z. I can acknowledge it's Z, and I can argue that it's, 
you know, we should rethink things, but ultimately it'd be wrong to not point out that the majority of people think it's X. And the best part is that the people saying that I was wrong, saying that the public isn't the state, also said that you've got to contribute to society. In other words, they say I've got to pay my taxes, because obviously, if we don't hand over all our money to the Play-Dohs, who's going to build the roads? But what do these people mean by, you've got to contribute to society? Okay, so here's my money, and I've got to contribute to society, guys, so who am I forced to give my money to? Do I give it to the beggar in the street? Do I pay my editor, who is a member of society, and also... Paying them contributes to society? No, that's not what they mean. When they say you've got to contribute to society, they mean that I've got to pay my taxes. And who do I pay my taxes to? The state. So society is the state. You've got to contribute to society. You've got to contribute to the state. That phrase that the critics use confirms what I'm saying to be true. When I explain that socialism has been defined historically as the public, in other words, state ownership or control of the means of production, I didn't make this up. Many socialists agree that this is the definition. I showed this in the video. I've shown it in subsequent videos, like my Hitler socialism video. And I use multiple sources to back up what I'm saying. I'm listing a bunch of these sources at the bottom of the screen. And I'd list even more, but there's not enough room. Yet, despite this, apparently, all I used was the dictionary. No, I used multiple sources, including the dictionary. You'll notice that Karl Marx and Engels are in there too, as is Rosa Luxemburg. I'm not just using the dictionary, I'm using primary and secondary sources too. Another criticism leveled at me in the Hitler Socialism video was that I quoted from Sargon of Akkad in my video. No, I did not. I quoted from three socialists who gave their own definition of socialism live during a Sargon of a Cod video. That's not the same thing as quoting from Sargon. Well, all three of these socialists gave varying definitions of socialism, proving that they didn't know exactly what socialism is. But, as I explained, they all actually meant the same thing. When the workers get together, they form a society. Society is the state. So, for example, when Xerxes said that socialism was worker ownership of the means of production, whether he realises it or not, that means state control. And he even admits this when he says that it's when the workers control the state apparatus with a Dell computer. Because apparently, according to socialists, we can now run the entire economy off one Dell computer. Finnish Bolshevik and Bad Mouse were the other two of the three socialists, and are the reason I use this reference in the first place because my public versus private video and my Hitler's socialism videos were both responses in part to their videos or comments criticizing me. I was responding to the Finnish Bolshevik and Bad Mouse, as well as many others, so I needed to find out exactly what they thought socialism was. Well, the Finnish Bolshevik defined socialism as the collective ownership of the means of production, which he says is the classic Marxist definition. I agree with the Finnish Bolshevik, who, despite his many other flaws, is actually an honest socialist, unlike many others. Finnish Bolshevik then lists the Soviet Union, China, several Eastern European countries, and Cuba as all being socialist countries. Well, they're all states. Weird that, isn't it? He also, by the way, contradicts Xerxes in his definition because Xerxes was trying to pretend that socialism isn't state control, even though it is. So, if I'm wrong, is the Finnish Bolshevik also wrong? Are all the socialists who know socialism to mean the state ownership of the means of production also wrong? But note, I did not quote from Sargon himself. Not that that would really matter if I did, but I actually didn't. So, the criticism is completely wrong. Nevertheless, the criticism was there. LMAO. This <clears throat> naughty nerd cited Sargon of Akkad and Timcast as sources. Others asked why this was an issue, and user paid government shill said they're both cretins who don't have a clue what they're talking about. Marx and Engels are both cretins, but we're allowed to quote from them. Hegel is an emotional contradiction. But that's fine, apparently. However, we'll just ignore those facts. 
Well, it's good news for Tick, since he was in fact citing Bad Mouse, Xerxes and the Finnish Bolshevik, not Sargon. So if we're going to dismiss sources on the basis that they were made by cretins, we are only going to be dismissing Timcast then. Even still, that doesn't take away from his main argument. All that takes away from his argument is one point. I repeat, one point on how nobody in academia has a pair of balls. And anyway, dismissing a source on the basis they're written by cretins is a silly idea. Even sillier is the idea that I think OP was getting at, that you can dismiss the rest of the argument based on one fiftieth of the sources used. I don't necessarily agree 100% with Sargon or Tim Pool, but even so, I don't think it's right to dismiss their arguments. And in the case of Tim Pool, I wasn't quoting from him either. I was quoting from a news source that he displayed in his video. Why? Because it was through Tim that I heard about this issue, so I wanted to give him some credit for covering the topic. Tim, like me, is someone who abandoned the left. These lefty critics of mine and Tim's might want to ask themselves, why we abandoned the left. What was the reason we decided that socialism wasn't what it made itself out to be? Maybe if you started listening to us, you would understand. But going back to the larger point, there's plenty of socialists saying that socialism is state control of the economy. Rosa Luxemburg said, Socialism means the striving of the proletariat to bring about the dictatorship of its class in order to get rid of the present form of production. She wants to form a dictatorship over the economy, the state ownership of the means of production, and calls that socialism. But no, Rosa girl, you're wrong. The lefties who worship you, who have been misled by their statist teachers into believing that socialism is when there's puppy dogs and rainbows, says you're wrong. So you are, girl. Then you've got the Labour Party manifesto of 2017. For the many, not the few, apparently, because this is now Star Trek. The Labour Party is the International Socialist Party of the UK. Many basic goods and services have been taken out of democratic control through privatisation. What does this mean? Democracy is when you vote for the state, giving the state power. So, the Labour Party are saying that goods and services were taken out of state power via privatisation. So they want to bring private rail companies back into public ownership. Well, they used to be nationalised into the state, so they want to bring them back into public state ownership. So there you go, we have a direct quote from the Labour Party, the supposed Workers' Party of the UK, more like the Shirkers' Party of the UK, using the word public to mean state. Reverse the privatisation of Royal Mail at the earliest opportunity. Again, Royal Mail used to be in state control, and they want to reverse the privatisation and make it state-owned again so they can read our mail. That sounds like public state ownership or control of the means of production to me. You've got Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Marx, numerous other socialists, the Labour Party, loads of dictionaries, a colossal amount of history books, all saying that socialism is the public state control or ownership of the means of production. There's a convergence of evidence all pointing to the same definition. But when I say this, apparently I'm wrong. No, you're wrong if you think socialism is anything other than state ownership or control of the means of production. It's not when two workers hold a hammer or when two girls share one cup. It's when there's a totalitarian state in control of the economy. It's not when money has gone away <laughs> no, it's not. It's when the state is in control of the economy, regardless of what that economy looks like. If you think it's anything other than this, you have been tricked. You have been lied to. When I was a socialist, I knew it, what socialism was. The difference was that I was also been tricked into believing that if the state did stuff, it was good. And that when the free market did stuff, that was bad. Who taught me this? State minions in the miseducation system. Now I see reality. The free market is good, and socialist totalitarianism is bad, unsurprisingly. Now, going back to Horatio, he said, Forgive me if you've changed your mind on this, but I've heard you define a private business as owned by an individual or a family, and that's it. How does this correlate with historical definitions? Which political theorists 
are there who would define Apple or Tesla as a publicly owned business because it's publicly traded? Okay, here's a quick Google search for what is a share. Investopedia says shares are units of equity ownership in a corporation. Wikipedia says a share is an indivisible unit of capital expressing the ownership relationship between the company and the shareholder. Hargreaves says a share is simply a part ownership of a company. When a company is listed on the stock exchange, the shares have a market value and can be bought and sold. Knee Business Info says shares represent ownership of a company. When an individual buys shares in your company, they become one of its owners. I can keep going down the list. There's hundreds, if not thousands of results, all saying the same thing. Shares are shares of ownership in a company. Something that's publicly traded is publicly owned. Let's take Amazon as an example. This article from Yahoo Finance is from July 2022. It shows this chart. Yes, individual investors like Jeff Bezos own 9.8% of the corporation and other institutions own 59.7% of the corporation. But 30.3% of the corporation is owned by the general public, which is individual people who have bought some shares. They even have a section titled General Public Ownership. They say the general public, who are usually individual investors, hold a 30% stake in Amazon.com. While this group can't necessarily call the shots, it can certainly have a real influence on how the company is run. This is shared ownership of the means of production. This is public ownership of the means of production. This is worker ownership of the means of production. Whatever you want to call it, it's precisely what the socialists are calling for. There's a reason why there was a cartoon in the 1800s of Karl Marx shaking hands with Wall Street bankers and corporates. They are one and the same. Karl Marx was doing the bidding of Wall Street. He was calling for the shared ownership of the means of production. More power to the corporations, also known as syndicates. Syndicalism, or corporatism, is a left-wing ideology. I wonder why. Going back to Horatio, he said that I was wrong because nobody defines Apple or Tesla as a publicly owned business just because it's publicly traded. But they do. Publicly owned and publicly traded are the exact same thing as every source in the world says so. When you buy a share, you're buying shared ownership of the company. I don't know how you didn't know this, but you didn't. And you're not the only one. This is a very common criticism of me that I said that corporations are shared ownership of the means of production. Which it is, but apparently people didn't realise this. And then you and all these other critics have the nerve to say that I don't know what I'm talking about. Well... I think you'll find that I do know what I'm talking about. I think you'll find that my political and economic opinions are not opinions. They're facts and aren't completely ludicrous as you claim they were. I think you'll find that I do understand more than the very basics of the political theory I discuss. It is, in fact, yourself uh, that is wrong, who doesn't understand the basics, who didn't even know what a share is, and you're not the only one, lots of people criticising me, also didn't know what shares or shares of ownership are. You guys didn't listen. You misinterpreted what I said, and then you unsubscribe like so many others have done for absolutely no reason, just because you assumed that I was wrong. But I wasn't wrong. You were. This is what frustrates me. People wonder why I get frustrated and annoyed or respond to the trolls. These aren't trolls. Horatio is not a troll. Horatio has got a misguided view of the world. But the frustrating thing is that the critics like Horatio are so adamant that they're right that they'll dismiss all the evidence. They'll dismiss everything I say. They'll unsubscribe. They'll spout lies about what I said. They'll claim I didn't know anything about what I was talking about, which is all not true. I do know what I'm talking about. Horatio is the one who's wrong here, as are a lot of other critics. Yet somehow, 
I'm the one who gets this reputation that I don't know anything about politics and economics. But it's not me, it's them. I, they don't know what they're talking about, but somehow they've managed to project their ignorance onto me. They don't know, so they accuse me of not knowing, even though I do know. It, it's just frustrating. Bearing in mind, it's not just the critics who think corporations are private entities. I've read books and have heard Austrian economists refer to corporations as being capitalist. I'd love for someone from the Austrian camp, like Tom Woods or whoever, to dive into the sources and verify whether what I've said in my videos are right or wrong. I want to know for absolute certainty that if socialism is social ownership, why are public corporations that are socially owned by their shareholders classed as being private? Is it not shared ownership? Then what's the point of a share of ownership? Maybe someone can ask around for me and get a response from someone like Tom Woods because, well, that would be awesome. Horatio then says, you have widened the definition of community to include everything that isn't a family, because that's politically convenient for you to do. Why isn't a family a community? How isn't a family-owned farm not actually a mini socialist state, just like Apple or Tesla? <sighs> okay, Horatio, let's just pretend that a family-owned farm or business is socialism now. So are we all living in a socialist paradise? Because all the family-owned farms and businesses exist, so it must be socialism, right? Oh wait, no, because that's stupid. Are you seriously suggesting that a family-owned farm is a socialist state? I mean, it's simply ridiculous. And what you're essentially asking here is, why isn't a village a city? Well, the reason a village isn't a city is because villages are smaller than cities. There's less buildings, less people, less infrastructure. Villages aren't cities for the same reason that families are not socialist states. They're too small, and you can't have socialism on the family level. If you could, then just go away and implement socialism and leave the rest of us alone. Historically, a family was defined as something smaller than a community. In fact, I showed precisely this in the public versus private video. A family would merge with others to become larger families. In ancient times, these were known as gentes, which is where we get the word gentleman from. In other words, families would get bigger until they became noble families in the hierarchy. Above this, you would then have the fratria or curia, fraternities or brotherhoods, which are even larger families again. And then several of these small societies would merge into new hierarchies to form tribes. Tribes would then come together to form a city, and multiple cities would form a kingdom or a nation or whatever. I'm not making it up. This is what happened historically. I showed the sources in the video. And maybe, yeah, maybe a family could be classed as a community or a mini socialist state. Perhaps that is the case. However, that's not how it was defined historically. This is a history channel, not a make-believe political fiction channel. I have to stick with the history, not what you or I might mistakenly believe. Now, we can certainly make an argument that a family is somehow socialist. And that's fine, but that's not what it was historically. And I would also say it doesn't make sense to call it that. It's too small to be classed as a community by itself. Private property means an individual or small family property, not communism. So even logically, it doesn't make sense to say that a family is a communist utopia. It's not because it's politically convenient for me to say this, it's because that's just the way it is in reality. I'll try to be brief, as I'm on a mobile and I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this, but the heart of social ownership is ownership by the community in which it operates. State ownership is not automatically social ownership, as the state may not necessarily be a legitimate representative of the community. If it isn't, then the community has no claim to ownership of state assets. Okay, so there's a couple of points here, and again, he's certainly not the only one to say this, just one of the more recent ones. So, the first portion of this assumes that state ownership is not automatically social ownership. Yes, it is, because the state is society, as explained before. I'm not going to labour over this point, we've already been over it before, but he says the state may not necessarily be a legitimate representative of the community. 
it isn't a legitimate representative of the community. It never will be. Democracy is a lie. It's snake oil. And this is where I disagree with Mises, who was pro-democratic, at least in his early years. No, the state isn't and cannot be a representative for me. It might claim to be, it might pretend to be, but it isn't. That's my entire point. The state is not me, even though it claims to be, and even though the language says it is. They say that the state is society, and because I'm a member of society, therefore I have to contribute to society. Except, I'm not a member of society. The state is not society, even though it claims to be, and therefore I don't want to contribute to society, the state. However, historically, the state has claimed to be society, and the language represents this because people have mistakenly believed for millennia that the state is society. And you've got to contribute to it with tribute, peasants. I can't change that, unfortunately, but I can point it out, which is what I'm doing. You say, if the state isn't a legitimate representative of the community, then the community has no claim of ownership of state assets. Correct. And the best part is, this is exactly what socialism is. Socialism is a lie. It promises you something it won't deliver. You think that socialism will benefit the workers, or the common man. No, it's designed to trick you into voting in totalitarianism. It's not a legitimate representative of you or I, despite calling itself a democracy. It's lying to you. The ideology is designed to trick you into believing the lie. The red pill is waking up from the matrix and seeing the world for as it really is. That's what you need to do now. You need to realize that socialism, communism, whatever, are all lies designed to trick you into enslaving yourself. Just wake up. You can like or dislike social ownership. That's not the point here. Correct. The point is that you can't just define it as something that it isn't. I've not done that. I've given you the historical definitions. I have engaged with you, Tick. I have watched hundreds of hours of your videos, and I have watched all the content you've made on your politics, including the longest one, repeatedly before unsubscribing. I respect you as a content creator and for how you engage with your community, like you are in this conversation. I've heard you out. I just disagree. The argument just doesn't hold water. Yeah, the argument I didn't make, but you think I did, doesn't hold water. Hmm. You didn't hear me out. You let your emotions cloud your judgment, and you misheard what I said. You don't disagree with me. You disagree with the straw man argument you're pretending that I said. And for this reason, I don't believe that you watched my videos repeatedly, before unsubscribing. If you did, your ears were open, but your mind was closed. More likely, you weren't listening, or were seeing what others were, people were writing in the comments, or on Reddit, or on other YouTube channels, and jumped to conclusions about what I was trying to say, rather than what I actually said. Hundreds, or thousands, of other people managed to watch what I said and didn't come to the conclusions you've made, yet somehow you did. I don't know how you did this, and you're not the only one, but you're wrong. Now, another point that I said in these videos, but need to clarify because a lot of people seem to miss this, is that corporations are states. They're not the central state, although they might be, but they are states by themselves. The definitions of all the words we've used so far makes this clear. They are means of production that are publicly owned therefore are democratic and socialist. They're not private. By society's own rules, once they're on the stock exchange, they're no longer private. They've evolved or leveled up from private to public, and have thus become mini-states in themselves. If a tribe can be a tribal state, then how can a corporation with thousands of employees not be classed as a state? It makes no sense not to class them as a state because there's nothing private about them. Yes, they might have a CEO, an individual who runs the show, but the show itself, the body of the people, the body of the nation, the corporation, is public. He is the public representative of the public corporation. He's not private, and he's not privately owning the corporation. Public corporations aren't private, 
and therefore aren't part of the private sector and can't be classed as capitalist. Yet these facts don't stop people like this guy expressing the view that this isn't the case. Definitions from Oxford Languages Private enterprise equals business or industry managed by independent companies or private individuals rather than being controlled by the state. Yes, a private enterprise isn't controlled by the state. But we're not talking about private enterprise. We're talking about corporations and big businesses. That's where you've gone wrong. Private sector equals is the part of the national economy that is not under direct state control. Correct. But we're not talking about the private sector. We're talking about the public sector. Free market equals an economic system in which prices are determined by unrestricted competition between privately owned businesses. Correct. But we're not talking about a free market or privately owned businesses. We're talking about publicly owned businesses and the non-free market. Capitalism. An economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. Correct. But we're not talking about private ownership of trade and industry. We're talking about public ownership of trade and industry. Big businesses and corporations that are independent and not controlled by the state are, by definition, private enterprises and part of the private sector. No, corporations are publicly owned. They aren't independent of the state. The government creates them. And they are states in and of themselves. They are public. They are not private enterprises and therefore are not part of the private sector. They are monopolies created by the state. Corpse, body, organ, organs of the state. Bodies of the state, bodies of the people, corporations. That's what the word actually means. Your exclusion of big businesses and corporations from the private sector is warping the definitions of these words. No, your inclusion of big business and corporations in the private sector when they are not privately owned or run is warping your definition of these words. You are wrong, not me. And there's loads of other arguments like this. There's a YouTuber with a reasonably sized audience of over 100,000 subscribers who responded to my public versus private video. I was going to do a response to him here, but I've cut it out due to the length of the video. So if you guys want me to make a response to him, I can do, but maybe it's not worth it because he probably won't listen to me anyway, since as a dialectical materialist, he doesn't believe that anything exists. There is one counter-argument that I do need to address, though, because I realised before I published the public versus private video that this might be an issue, and it was. Um, I didn't put it in the video because I didn't think many people would notice, but it turns out they did notice, and a lot of people asked me about it. So, I said in the public versus private video that when a private family gets larger, it becomes part of the public sector. People then asked, okay, when does this transition happen? At what number of people does it happen? Like, if a group of 50 people is classed as private, is a group of 51 people public? When's the cutoff point? Is there a cutoff point? And some people ask this because they were being genuinely curious and wanted clarification. Fair enough. But a lot of people claim that because I didn't or couldn't define this with hard numbers, it proved my definitions were wrong. So, okay, I need to clarify this. At what number of people does a village become a town? At what number of people does a town become a city? You'll find that there isn't a set definition. There are villages here in the UK with only a couple of thousand people in them that are classed as cities, and cities that are classed as towns because they, they've not been formally declared as cities. Some have cathedrals, some don't. There are cities with fewer people in them than some towns, and towns with fewer people in them than some cities. And the reason why is because the distinction between a village and a town and a city is not set in stone. That's not my fault. That's not my definitions of these things being wrong. That's just reality. 
And we can argue about this and we can debate it and maybe we can formalize the definitions in the future, but for now, there is no definition. If we take Google, it says, a village is a group of houses and associated buildings larger than a hamlet and smaller than a town, situated in a rural area. But Wikipedia contradicts this, saying a village is a clustered human settlement or community larger than a hamlet but smaller than a town, with a population typically ranging from a few hundred to a few thousand. Though villages are often located in rural areas, the term urban village is also applied to certain urban neighbourhoods. So, it's not rural. A village can be urban. And what do you mean by a few hundred or a few thousand? Is two thousand a few? Is three thousand a few? Is five thousand a few? Where's the cutoff? If four thousand is the cutoff and a village has exactly three thousand nine hundred ninety nine people in it, does that mean that if someone stays in the local hotel, the village suddenly gets converted into a town? And if the guy leaves the hotel the next day, does the town then revert back into a village? The point of all this is to say that there's no set definition or number to these principles. That's not my fault, that's just reality. Similarly, what, what is a small group? What is a large group? Is 10 people a small group, but 11 people a large group? You know, where's the cutoff? Well, according to Wikipedia, in psychology, a small group is considered to be 3 to 9 individuals. But there are other sources that say it's 4 to 12, or 3 to 12, or whatever. Some people define a large group as 20 people or more, while others say 10 or more. So, for some, 10 is a small group, but others think that 10 is a large group. And the reason why is because these things haven't formally been defined. The same principle applies to the idea of a small private family and a large public family. I don't know exactly where the cutoff point is because it hasn't been defined. That's not my fault, that's just the reality of the situation. I actually think it's because they're deliberately flexible enough terms so that they can apply depending on the situation. So a family of four might own a farm and might be classed as private, but then their neighbours own a farm but have 12 kids. Well, they'd still be classed as private even though the numbers have changed. The main problem is that these terms are interpreted in different ways by different people. But here's the deal. What matters is that when you get to a thousand people, I would say that's no longer private. When you have a corporation or a hierarchy with thousands of people in it, it's no longer private. So if the cutoff is, let's say, 50 people or 100 people, it doesn't matter for our purposes because we're talking about huge corporations and tiny family-owned businesses. You can't say that a corporation like Amazon is a small family-like group or an individual because by anyone's definition, we know that thousands of people are absolutely not a small family. And this is where the oxymoronic term of private corporations come into play. Private means individual or small family-like group, while corporation means a large group or organ of the public state. Yet private corporations exist. Well, really, there needs to be a third word, a middle word, between public and private to represent this middle ground. But unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, such a word does not exist. I could make one up, but then I'd be accused of inventing terms, which is what I'm avoiding on this particular issue, even though technically it's perfectly fine to do that. That's how language evolves. But I have deliberately avoided creating new words or terms when discussing this topic so as to not give my enemies more ammunition against me. The only term I did come up with was racial socialism to define national socialism, which is exactly what it is, but this was immediately latched onto by my critics as a way to dismiss what I was saying. Oh, he's just inventing terms, even though they're allowed to invent rubbish all the time. It's called Hegelianism. There are more arguments. Apparently, I said Rome was socialist at some point. <laughs> I don't remember when I said that, and despite asking for a timestamp, I'm still waiting. I've addressed the Tig thinks North Korea is a democracy argument in two videos now, including this one. There's also an entire debate on the political spectrum that I haven't addressed. That's maybe something to cover in the future. 
but I think I've covered most of the counter-arguments relating to the public versus private video. And maybe it's my fault, maybe I didn't make myself clear in the original videos, but actually I don't think so. I, most of you understood what I was saying, so clearly I wasn't speaking double dutch. It really does seem that people got triggered and then closed their eyes and ears and then just jumped to stupid conclusions. But the reputation that my enemies have given me, that I don't understand politics or economics and therefore shouldn't talk about these things and should stick to tanks, needs to stop. I do understand these topics perfectly well. Did I get elements of it wrong? Yeah, probably. I'm willing to change my mind, but I'm not going to change my mind when the counter-arguments completely miss the mark and are this poor. So I look forward to hearing what people say about this video because it's been a while since I talked about this topic. Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.